Okay, so Beaker is a electron application um, that provides a lot of behavior that you would expect out of a browser. And the sort of impetus for it is to create a browser that we can rapidly prototype ideas for the web platform, specifically with a mind toward decentral, uh, decentralization. Um, it's sort of like a pre-standards browser, and it's where we can prove out ideas and test them out and then try to push them perhaps back to vendors if we think that they're actually worth uh, doing that. And the first place that, that's, uh, that we're focusing is integrating the protocol that da uh, 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 Max Ogden's team is working on called DAT. Uh, so uh, if you don't know what DAT is, it's sort of like a combination of Git and BitTorrent. It allows you to um, use a public key to look up a file archive in a discovery network and then download it from multiple different peers. Um, there are a couple of different interesting properties about that uh, that have to do with the cryptography used. So I think what I should mention about that. I guess the most interesting thing is that each of these archives is identified with a public key that's 64 characters um, of hex-encoded um, data. And if you want to be able to look up an archive, you simply can run his team's tool, the DAT tool, on a folder. It will generate a key pair for you. And in this folder we're looking at, we have a couple of different files, file.txt, index.html, etc. And you can take this public key and input it as a URL and open up the contents of that folder as if it were a website. So that 64 character URL up there, that's the public key. And it's sort of a one-to-one -one equivalence with an IP address. Um, except that rather than asking for a specific uh, host in the um, in the global network, we're actually asking for a specific archive in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, that ends up giving us a lot of different kind of interesting things we can do. Uh, one of them is that because this is a protocol that is designed to ship around an entire file, file archive, we can actually, there's an icon here that's pretty hard to see, but we can actually open up the files that they, uh, comprise this site and look at them individually. So here's the file.txt, for instance. Um, the, uh, let's see, I guess maybe the easiest thing for me to do, since I don't really have this planned out, is just to show the things that I think are kind of fun that I haven't integrated into this. Um, one thing that's kind of cool is that this is somebody else's um, archive, I'm pulling it off of my command line, but Beaker itself can rehost archives uh, directly from the, the browser, so I can actually fork this archive using a drop down menu and uh, claim it as my own. Um, so. Right. Button. Um, and so now I have control over this, and unlike before, I can now add files and, and make changes to it. So um, as a method of sharing around just files like uh, images that you've taken or data sets, it's pretty good, but it's also sort of a way to ship around websites or web applications. Um, what more can I say about it? There is a swarming system in the background that um, basically keeps, you, you tap into whenever you open up one of these sites, and you will synchronize periodically in the background, so some UDP packets are sent out saying, hey, does anybody have anything new for this archive? If somebody does, um, we'll actually know about it inside the browser because we're actively listening, so I can turn on a live reloading feature. Um, and so what this will allow me to do is just listen for changes and automatically refresh the page. Um, whenever I make a, whenever I say it, which is just kind of a fun thing that we can do, thanks to how DAT works. Um, you can download the files here. You can download the files. Um, so I can, actually, the simplest way to show this is that I can just go into the uh, file listing and then say open it up in the finder. And so this is the um, internally stored uh, folder of those files. Um, so the thing that actually, the reason that that was sort of really worth trying first is that it makes it very, 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 very cheap to allocate what is the equivalent of a web domain. Each of these 64 character URLs is its own more or less .com. And we have ex uh, have it exposed to the um, application layer as a web API. So I have an application that puts this to use, uh, my log reader here. So this application is kind of like a little um, Twitter for a decentralized system. Well, I make a quick change to show this flow. 
Um, so potentially the, the whole DAT system, the, that protocol, when it's exposed to web APIs, can be used to publish content and also consume content. So this application, it's intentionally the same thing as Twitter is, where you're having different data sources that we're synchronizing down. And it's the API is just reading files. So what it does is I have two um, DAT archives listed here that each of them have a folder inside of them, the log folder, and inside of them they have .txt files. And so I scan the archive uh, file listing there and then say, okay, every time I find a .txt, I'm just gonna stick it into the feed right here, and so each of these .txt files are ordered by their creation time and put into a, a merged feed, so it behaves sort of like Twitter does. So if we want to look like look at what that looks like, I have my personal blog site with one of those things, and I have that hosted on the DAT protocol. And if we jump into the file listing, we'll see there's a log folder, and here are the .txt files. Um, and so here's my hello world post, simple plain text, and that is recreated down here at the bottom. See that there? So in addition to the read APIs, we also have some write APIs. So if we want to actually use this as a way to publish new content, we can say, let's create a new post. And the application I'm using asks permission to create a new data archive. And so we'll go ahead and do that. And this data archive will be managed by the browser. Um, but the site will now have um, the rights to um, add new files into this archive. So here it is, here's the post I just made. And that was um, handled by creating an entirely new data archive with a log folder. And here's the .txt file with the content of our post. And so now we can continue to write posts and it'll just write files directly into the archive. And we will see it now listed here. And there's my second post. Um, Oh, just it's okay, just to, I'm going to go to the last one, so. The, the beaker site. The beaker site? Beaker browser. Okay. Um, let, me, let me finish my point here, which is that the, the thing that um, I think actually is um, important about this sort of um, architecture is that the DAP that I publish this content into is completely separated from the application that created the content. So this archive in which I've produced um, these two posts um, is completely separated from the log reader that created it. And so if we wanted to use a different front end application, we could. Um, so there's just, it, it's, um, there's no lock in into this particular log application. And if I wanted to, I could jump into the file viewer and fork this thing. And, uh, there you go. So what, why do you think I should jump to the um, speaker browser side? Because they can go to that in their normal browser and speaker browser. That's a good point. <laughs> so yeah, speakerbrowser.com. Um, and yeah, it's only built for Mac right now. Um, it's, at some point in the future, will be a Windows build put together. I just haven't had the time for that yet. Um, there is one other thing worth showing that we have DNS integrated. Let's see if it'll work for us. So this is a website that's hosted over DAT as well. And we just use a TXT record. And so when I look up hostless.website, there's a TXT record that points to a DAT link that allows us to have um, nice short names for DAT sites. And uh, you can put that on a billboard. So there you have it. So that's it. That's uh, the Beaker browser. Pretty awesome. Oh, well, that's a question. So how fast do things download? Um, there's no reason it should be um, much slower than how the best of like HTTP is. There's a little bit of addition, additional overhead, but um, not significant. Okay. Yep. Just like the resolution time to like. Yeah, the discovery network is relatively fast. There's actually a couple of different overlapping protocols in use to do that. One of them is the BitTorrent mainline DHT. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also multicast UDP if you're on the Wi-Fi, and okay. so you're actually able to sync these things directly from one computer to another. Oh, so it's even faster if it's like yeah. you go to a website. Normally, it's like 5,000 miles away, but hey, it happens to be next door. So yeah, so like South Africa or something. You know? Yeah, and you also are going to cache the files offline. So after the first read, it's going to be uh, yeah. very fast. Okay. Very cool. Well, what's the difference between DAT and IPFS? They're very similar. Um, the fundamental premises are almost one-to-one, -one, but there's some actually some unique differences between DAT and IPFS. One of the first things is that DAT uses an append-only version log behind its metadata system. So it keeps track of the history of the archive, whereas IPFS does not. 
what that actually is going to allow us to do is put versioning into the URLs. And so um, I know I'm kind of brushing up on time here, but I just want to show. Oh, I guess I don't want to be out here. OK, check this out. That's using ES6 modules to import JavaScript um, from another DAT archive. And what we'll be able to do is, before the yoyo.js, we'll be able to put an at symbol and say at you know, 2.1.0 and pull a specific version of the file. So that's mm -hmm. one very good difference. There's also an interesting secure sharing system that I won't get into right now, but you actually have some good security guarantees in DAT that you can't give. 